Thank you all, um, and I'm happy to be here. A couple of key points before I start. Uh, the company that I have now is called Devology. My old company is Brand Action Team. Contact information is in the brochure, and there are some cards in the back, and I'll be happy to hand out uh, as we go. Um, if you want more detail on some of the things that I'm talking about, because you've only got a 30-second slot here, I did a webinar for the program, which is, you can find it on uh, the Beverage Trade Network site, which is a great half-hour presentation on the things that you need to know to uh, get into the U.S. market. I also publish a lot of my slides on SlideShare, so any presentations that I make around the world, I make available to everybody. If you go to SlideShare, look up my name, you'll find stuff there. I'd also invited everyone to connect with me in LinkedIn, and I post on LinkedIn as well. And in LinkedIn, you'll find a list of all the upcoming trade shows and uh, competitions for wine and spirits in the United States. A very useful tool that I keep updated. And then lastly, I write a blog called OH, as in alcohol opinions, uh, and I post a lot of stuff there. The most important thing I can tell you today, beyond you know, listening to me and all those great ideas, get Deborah Gray's book, How to Import Wine. It's a primer on everything that you need to know, and if it doesn't give you the answer, it sure will raise the question. And knowing what all the questions are going to be before they get asked is probably key to being successful in this industry. Okay, so much for the prelim. Uh, can somebody turn this thing on? Yeah, so what we are, we're, we're, we do strategic manning, planning. I call it routes to market. How are you going to get to the market? What kind of import structure are you going to do, distribution, and so forth? But we also do uh, public relations, and we focus separately on both trade and consumer. We do advertising. Uh, trade marketing is a focus. And then, whoops, sorry, digital and social. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, sorry, I have to keep looking here. So let's talk a little bit about consumer trends. This is in addition to what John had uh, talked about, but a little more kind of local color. Millennials represent the largest uh, cohort of uh, drinkers in the United States, and that's where the future of the industry is going to be. It doesn't mean that baby boomers are not important. What it does mean is this is the future, so you need to market to them. What's changing, we talked about this a little bit. 12 to $20 is the sweet spot, which is great because there's, for wine I'm talking about, there's an opportunity where you can make some margin. Trying to compete at yellowtail levels is, is really not something that's uh, financially feasible. But it's important to recognize that millennials behave very, different free, very differently from previous generations. Um, and they're the ones that are driving all these new trends that we're seeing, Moscato, Prosecco, red, red blends. They're very open to imported brands and particularly new world wines. Um, important point, they don't get their information from magazines. If you ask a typical 30-year-old in America, they do not subscribe to any magazines and they do not pay to access Wine Spectator ratings uh, online. They get it from their smartphones and they get it from their friends and they get it from websites. And we'll talk about that. Um, so authoritative information to them is not what Wine Spectator says or what uh, uh, James Suckling says or anybody like that. It's what their friends say. Um, but they're also going to apps. And there's a bunch of them out there now that are fighting for uh, uh, leadership. Vivino, Hello Vino, Delectable, Next Glass, uh, Snooth, and some others. But they're paying attention to what others say on social media, even people that they don't know. So they may be peers, if not personal friends. And as I said, they don't subscribe to magazines, but the scale is changing. As an example, Wine Spectator's uh, circulation is 400,000. Wine Enthusiast is about 177. Robert Parker is 48,000. Vivino, I'm sorry, Wine Searcher gets 3 million unique visitors. Vivino has 10.9 million users. Two weeks ago, that was 10.3. Vivino increased in the last two weeks, greater than the entire circulation, all the wine magazines in the United States. That's where you need to be paying attention because that's where the consumers are going. Okay, what does that mean? Well, you know, in the old world, you know, that old advertising phrase about, I know only half my advertising works, I just don't know which half. And if you look all the way at the other end of the spectrum is pure e-marketing, 
uh, e-commerce and stuff that happens online and is very trackable. And so, you know, we moved from the early days of marketing to mass media advertising here. But what's happened is we moved that dot all the way over. So now when somebody's on Vivino, oftentimes they physically have a bottle in their hand. They, we know two things. They're looking for more information on that particular product. And most importantly, they can buy it right now because they're physically holding it. To me, that is so much more important than somebody who might be leafing through a magazine or even just having a conversation online. So uh, you got a, a, a simple choice here, adapt or become irrelevant. Uh, so let's talk about adapt. OK. Stop shouting and start talking. Engaging with people, where's the thing? You need to engage with them on social media and then monitor, measure, and manage the conversations. And I'm going to give you just highlights on a couple of tools that are basically free that allow you to do that. The second most important thing is content is king. We've heard that. A couple of other people have said that. But I like to add to it, context is queen. So the content only matters if it's available in the right place. And instead of making people come to you, the strategy for online marketing today is go where they're already gathered. You'll never get 10.9 million people to come to your website. But you can get 10.9 people who are interested in wine. You can get in front of them by putting your information on uh, sites like Vivino and Hello Vino and so forth. You can take control over how your brand is presented to the consumer. And you'll see that in, in a case this or a, a slide coming up. Retail is evolving. John alluded to it. This is really important. We have these things called delivery within an hour services. They just popped up in the last like 16 months. Uh, one's called uh, Drizzly. Pernod Ricard invested in that. Uh, there's mini bar delivery, whom we're working with, saucy, thirsty, drink, and, and a whole bunch of others. And what that means is in major markets, New York, San Francisco, even Minneapolis and Denver, you can call up, or um, actually not call up, you do it on your, your uh, smartphone, and you can order wine, beer, or spirits, or any combination, and have it delivered and be there within an hour. That's the way millennials uh, think, and they, they like it. OK, it's working. So, and the fourth one is retail store trading, area, uh, trading areas are no longer barriers. The physical idea that you're only going to be selling to people in New York within like maybe a three block radius of your physical store. In reality, it's everybody in the US now if you get involved in e-commerce. And the smart guys, James was talking about Aster, uh, Crush, uh, and some of the others, uh, Chamber Street Wines and so forth. So let's take them one at a time. I'm trying to go fast here. I'm from New York. I talk fast, I'm trying to squeeze a lot in. The first one is build a community. And so what you want to do is encourage or empower people to share and tell your story in their words. Here's why that's important. It's not a matter of building 100,000 Facebook friends so that you can talk to them. It's much more important to get 500 Facebook friends who tell your story to their network because that expands exponentially. Instead of the 100,000 that you might hope to get to your website, you may be talking to one or 10 million people. And that's where you can really leverage the power of the US population and the efficiency of the internet for communications. So, couple of pieces of advice. Don't try and do everything, OK? We see this with a lot of people. Well, here's my Facebook, here's my Twitter, here's my Instagram, here's my YouTube. You can't do that. Pick one or two, do them really well, and do them consistently. Second most important thing is Facebook. The game is paid to play. The lady yesterday talking about digital marketing made the point that organic, uh, the, when you post something on Facebook, it will only be exposed to about 2% of your the like base that you have. If you run an ad on Facebook, it'll go to about 70 or 80 percent of them. So the deal is really simply, if you're going to use Facebook as a strategy, you must allocate a budget for Facebook advertising. To do anything on Facebook without an advertising budget is foolish and wasteful. Uh, whoops, I had one more there, sorry. And then lastly, images and videos rule. Fun, engaging, short videos. Even commercial messages can be cool, but bring something new to the party and make it fun. Kittens, babies, well, I wouldn't use babies in liquor ads, but you know, the, the idea is you know, put stuff that other people want to share with other people. Humor is interesting. OK, social media. I like to think of it as free market research. Think about this. You've got, did I do that again? 
sorry. Facebook and Google have services. Facebook is called Insights, Facebook Insights. Google's is called Google Analytics on your website. This is free information, a wealth of very, very uh, expansive information that you can go in there and see what people actually do when they go on those sites, not what they tell you they're going to do in the old world of doing uh, uh, focus groups and things like that that we used to do. So absolutely, that's an area where everybody, it, it's sitting out there, it's a resource, you should use it. Enough said about that. And really, the philosophy goes like this. Look, that generates data. You need to turn that data into information and then again turn that information into insights. What are people doing? And then take that information on what they're doing and say, how can I twist that and make that work for me? We're going to show you a couple of examples in a second because you can turn that into action. There's a tool out there, a company called Vintank, and actually uh, there was a slide that John had that had, had uh, something about them on there. They're out in California. They run a program called Social Connect, and basically it's a wine-oriented social media monitoring, measurement, and management uh, interface, and it's like 75 bucks a month. Uh, if you're going to be running a social media campaign for wine, you need to be using that. It's, it's state-of-the-art, and it's pretty uh, efficient. I talked about content is king. Well, um, what do I mean by content population? That, that means getting information out on the web and putting it on the sites that people who you want to talk to are already going to, okay? At the precise moment in time when they're most interested in that particular subject and your particular wine. If I'm thinking about where I'm going to have dinner, I'm more interested in what the name of the restaurant is. I'm not thinking about what wine I'm going to have it. But if I'm looking up Cabernet Sauvignon, that gives me as a marketer a clue. I want to talk to the person who's talking about Cabernet. The guy going to the restaurant might be interested in wine down the road. I know that the guy in, or woman interested in Cab is interested in wine. Um, and the way to do it is to leverage the authenticity and of trusted sites. One of the programs we did, here's one, there's a trade magazine called Sante Mag Magazine. It goes to about 37,000 very influential high-end restaurant owners. We had a series of articles that we ran in there, and this was on behalf of Wines of Chile, and it, it was a profile of, a, of each of 14 valleys, but we did 12 of them, it was one per month, okay? We did a, something similar, which was a comprehensive guide to the wines of Chile that was published on Snooth. That stuff we did three, four years ago, it's still sitting there and it's still being visited and let me show you just how much. When we originally posted each individual article on the Sante site, it would get like maybe 95 or 100 people reading it, great. Okay, and over the course of the year, in the week after we posted it, uh, it was read by about 575 people. After 15 months, we were still counting, we had 44,000 views of that information. Think of it, I mean, it's just sitting there that people are finding when they're in interested in it. That's like a 7,000% return on investment. That's fabulous, and it's still paying dividends. This is four years later, the numbers are still great. And most importantly, if you look at it, the average duration, time on site, was double what the usual time on site was for the, for the site. So when we're providing valuable, non-commercial content, and it, it can even be commercial because when they're looking for information on a wine, they want to know what are the ratings, what are the reviews, all that kind of stuff. Well, you're the ones who have that information, and so, uh, you're responsible for getting it up there. We'll talk about how you do that. Um, last point, and this is for Deb. We had an interesting conversation the other day. Deb did a, uh, a webinar for BTN as well. I think he had about 270 people participating in the seminar. It's now been viewed 5,500 times. And that's in the last, what, like four weeks, five weeks, something like that. It's amazing, OK? So on sites like Vivino, you can claim and manage your website I mean, you're, the way your wines are listed. So you can go in there, there's the URL up there, and you can control the description, you can put in your uh, photo of your uh, label, a photo of your bottle, ratings, reviews, food pairing, winemaker notes, technical notes, and so on and so forth. I can't, I don't understand why most wineries in the US, and for sure, and around the world, don't do that, but to be, it's free. And how long does it take it? Get, get your kid to do it or, you know, the, the kid next door. Um, retail is evolving, as I said, with these delivery within an hour type services. Uh, I talked about some of the, here's what's different about them, okay? What we're seeing is e-commerce is really 
being used by, uh, by baby boomers. The reason why, they're used to paying shipping costs, and there's always shipping costs. If it's not explicit, it's embedded uh, in those kinds of deliveries. Um, and they're also accepting them, me, us, <laughs> uh, waiting till the next day. Millennials are just the opposite. Don't want to pay shipping charges, want immediate satisfaction. And so these delivery within an hour services kind of capitalized on that. So here's a case where the channel defines the audience. If you want to talk to millennials, talk to them through these networks because that's where the millennials are going. And it's growing like crazy. But you can also do programs with them so you can target programs uh, in particular cities, or in some cases, even um, uh, individual neighborhoods. And here's the big dis discovery we had with one client just this past year. It became a tool to drive retail distribution and support. How did that happen? Well, uh, we went and talked to these guys when they were first starting up. Actually, we're in a kind of a, a startup type office environment, and they were right across the hall, and they had a bottle of a product that I had developed. And I went over and said, who are you and what do you do? And they told us. We said, okay, let's get involved. How do we do it? They said, well, you've got to sell 10 stores in the New York area in this kind of geography so that we can be able to fulfill on delivery. And we said, okay, okay. can you give me a list of the stores? So he gave me a target list. We sent the sales guy out. Five days later, we had sold each one of them. And what was happening was when the sales guy normally walks into the door, just before he gets thrown out, um, he'll get yelled at, okay? What was happening here is he walked in and said, hi, my name is so-and-so, and I'm with working with Booze Carriage, was the name of the company at the time. The guy said, welcome, come on in, I'll take a case. Why did he say that? You guys were talking about what's in it for me? Somebody had already proved to him that working with Booze Carriage and Mini Bar and Drizzly is making him more money. He knew, for example, this retailer, he was making $67 for an average sale over booze carriage where he was making $15.18 from an average sale from somebody walking in the street. Which would you want to participate in? So they, somebody's already done the hard work of answering the what's in it for me question, set up the system to do it. Not only did we get distribution all across New York City, we also got a couple of accounts that were major e-commerce providers and within two weeks we were selling in 38 states. That's astonishing. We did not have distribution in any of those states, but e-commerce rep represents a way where you can, in fact, sell in states where you do not have physical distribution. And I think uh, they, they become, well, I mentioned, they become uh, a motivated e-commerce partner. So instead of just making the product available, they're much more willing and interested in working with you. And I think I have one example. Uh, I just talked about that. The e-commerce is really focused uh, on baby boomers that when they buy online, and this is particularly true of wine.com, they're buying it, uh, the average ring is going to be three times. So they're going to pay shipping, they're going to throw in a couple of wines uh, as it goes there. The other thing that's really important, we uh, saw some research, wine.com, which is the largest player in the e-com space, 53% of their sales are imported products. John used the number earlier today, it was about 23 three, 24%, and it had been up to 27%, that wine.com is double that. So if I'm going to come to the US, one of the things I want to do is get really involved in e-commerce, and I want to get on wine.com's um, product list, somehow, some way, some form. Um, people also recognize that e-commerce is a way to see and get uh, a broader selection of wines to be found on the web. If somebody goes to Wine Searcher, which is hugely important, and Wine Searcher searches uh, wine uh, pricing at stores all around the world. It's headquartered in New Zealand, uh, in fact. The question somebody's, so they're in a store, and they want to know, okay, what does it sell for? This guy's got it $29.99. I can see in Colorado it's selling $28.99. They're going to say, okay, I want to buy it from Colorado. Where do I buy it? He just has to hit that button and tomorrow he'll have the product at the price he wanted. And more than likely, the store that he was in didn't have the vintage that he wanted or the complete um, range of SKUs that that particular winery had. And so, hey, they've got a cab and they've got a cab Shiraz blend and they've got a pure Shiraz, I'm gonna buy all three. And content in the right products, move boxes. What do I mean by this? Well, at the end of the day, that's the business we're in, moving boxes. It's very nice to be living in wine country and the, all the wonderful things about the grapes and the wines and the natural and the terroir and biodynamic. At the end of the day, if we're not moving boxes, 
none of us are going to be here, okay? We gotta be selling stuff. So we were working on this product. It was an unfamiliar category. Um, nobody knew what the product name was. It was from a country. They didn't know where it was on the map. This was the guy who walked into the store in New York I was talking about. So um, this particular store, K&L, very small store, probably one-fourth the size of this room, store in LA, two in San Francisco, no bigger, and is probably the number three e-commerce retailer in the country. They have a guy who writes a spirit blog, and they have a guy who writes a wine blog. We got in contact, actually it was my daughter, got in contact with the guy who writes the spirit blog. He said, well, all I really want to do is interview the guy who is importing the brand. He happened to be a Hollywood guy, but still in all, he's done it for regular people as well. So he interviewed the guy, ran the article on his newsletter, which pushes out to 90,000 committed, motivated, interested spirits consumers who shop at his store. They're on the email list. That's who they are by definition. I don't care about anybody else in California at this point in time. I only care about the people who shop at the store where my product is sold. That's it, right? That's all I really want. So what happened was he posted it at 9 p.m. one night. By 11 a.m. the next morning, they had sold through 11 12-pack cases of a product nobody ever heard of. It's called Singani, if you want to know. It's kind of like a Pisco. Um, they reordered, sold out another 11 cases in the next two days, all based on this one email blast, ordered another 40 cases, and I only had 50 in inventory. We were working with John and MHW at the time. Transshipped some over. Over the last, so over about a 60-day period, we moved about 100 cases. And it continues to sell. This guy is an advocate. He speaks for us. He promotes it. And so then all of his people are now buzzing about it. And that's what got us. We're significant in California, all because of one interview from one well-targeted writer who's the right person. So could I run ads in trade magazines? Yes, and we recommend that our clients do that. Could I run ads in White Spectator? Yeah, we could do that. Which would be better, to give this guy a call and take him out to dinner in San Francisco? And by the way, I still haven't even taken him out to dinner yet. I just offered, and we got all this for free. So you can also use e-commerce as a strategic tool. I talked about the baby boomer focus. Um, but it, it, it's also gaining recognition as a place the one question we know is when somebody finds out about a wine, they're going to ask, where can I buy it? And you, David, mentioned earlier that you have to have that information on your website. You need the trade information of product photos, labels, high-res images, logos, all that kind of stuff. But the consumers, we know, about the, certainly for mixable white spirits, the most important thing they're looking for on websites is recipes. The second most important thing is, okay, now you got me convinced, I wanna buy it, where can I buy it? If you don't give them the answer where they are, you're gonna lose them. And so e-commerce represents an, an, uh, a place that people know, I don't need to know what the inventory is of my store, whether they have it, I can go online, and then I can find in Wine Search or anybody that has it. And if, if uh, Crush, if I'm living in New York and I shop at Crush and they don't have it, I can order it will be at my door tomorrow. You could also do that from Sherry Lehman, and you could do that for 50 years, but still in all, this is the technology version. And then lastly, my point earlier was that it allows you to sell in states where you do not have distribution. The best strategy I can give you in terms of route to market is this. Prove your product is a commercial success before you find an importer. And I'm, an importer, I mean a traditional importer. So we work with MHW a lot and use their import and distribution license, put salespeople out on the street, go out and call on on-premise and off-premise operators, sell those accounts, show that the product is moving. Then when I go and talk to a, a traditional importer or a distributor, in many cases we continue using MHW, um, they're more willing to talk because the question in their mind is, how do I know it's going to sell? Well, if you come in and you answer that objection before it even gets raised, that's wonderful. Create, somebody used the term yesterday, was it you, Sid, about the illusion of success or something like that? Illusion of discovery, thank you. And that's, that really is what was, what was, that's exactly what happened with the Singani example. Um, last point about that is it consummates everything else that you've done. All the PR, all the advertising, all the ratings, reviews, whatever is happening, tasting events, winemaker tours, none of that matters in the least 
if people don't buy the product. So it's up to you to provide a way for them to buy the product. And just having a distributor carrying the product not only is no guarantee that there will be retail availability, all it means is there's the potential for a sale. I'm sorry, last time I went to the bank and I tried to deposit potential, they didn't accept it. Um, and just one quick example of another kind of fun tool. It's, it's simple, but this happened to be for, it's hard to read, um, a particular uh, TBA that we were working with from Austria. And this is the way their product was listed on this particular e-com website's site. No picture, no label, there's nothing in there about the product. We did a little magic of the program that we have, and this is what the product looked like after we got done with it. Picture of the product, tasting notes, technical notes, food pairing, and now we have where to buy on those kinds of things. It's the equivalent of a fully dressed product on a retailer's shelf with a trained and knowledgeable salesperson standing by to help you. These are things you can do yourself to get your product optimized on the web so that when people find it, they find the information they're looking for, and they can then consummate that by actually making a purchase. Um, one of the things that's really critical in doing uh, another objection you're going to get is, well, how do I know it's going to sell? You want to get ratings and reviews by competitions that are recognized in the U.S. There may be competitions, and you know, the Melbourne thing is great, and, and Adam, congratulations for putting this on, and everybody should make a point of tasting the wines out there. But the, the reality is there's, there are four other, or three others, Adams is this one, the New York International Wine Competition, but three others that will accept wines and spirits that are not currently sold in the U.S. All this information will be available um, to you, as we've been saying. Enter these, and our philosophy is real simple. You keep entering them until you win a gold, and then you stop entering that one with that particular wine or spirit or whatever happens to be. So then when you're going and talking to importers or talking to distributors, you're saying, hey, I'm already on sale at Astor and Union Square. It's turning at like uh, a half a case per month for three months. And we've got a 91 from the New York International, and we've got a 94 from BTI. And now I'd like to talk to you. The guy's saying, oh, OK. You know, I'm, now you have something to talk about. So the takeaways, you can compete by doing a few things really, really well. But the key to the whole thing is to be committed, not just involved. What do I mean by that? Well, if you think about you having breakfast of bacon and eggs, right? The pig is committed, the chicken is involved. And you need to be involved. I mean, you need to be committed. OK, so last slide. What can you do? Engage through social media. It isn't enough to just participate on Facebook or to be active on Twitter. If you're not doing it in a strategic fashion and you're not measuring what you're doing, stop doing it because you have no idea if it's working. Um, guy once told me that it's like uh, winking at a pretty girl in the dark. You're the only one who knows what's, what's happening. Uh, content population. That's the strategy. It's open. It doesn't cost any money. Yeah, there are guys like me and our company, but others are figuring out how to do this stuff. We're kind of on the cutting edge, but it's out there. They're, they're, all these places are hungry for content. They need content. You're the ones that have it. And it's not just Wine Australia. It's each individual winery or spirit company. Um, and that's it. So uh, I think we've got a panel coming up next. So I'm going to say, if you have any questions for me, hold them. Uh, but I, what I'd like to do before, as we call the panel up now, is everybody, don't go anywhere, but just stand up and take a stretch, because you're going to have some really interesting questions and answers coming up right soon.